In the past lectures on energy, we've talked at length about the use of fossil fuels and even under renewables with the combustion of biomass, sources of chemicals and other particulate matter that enter the air and contribute to what we broadly describe as air pollution. For this section, you should be reading chapter 21. The text starts off with a case study talking in Los Angeles about the role of young students in tracking air pollution, which is a great concern, especially to school-aged children nowadays, with the increasing incidence of respiratory problems, and especially asthma, that have been directly linked to air quality problems. These problems are nothing new. Going back to London in the uh, 30s and 40s, uh, even as recently as that, there have been uh, situations where the air quality was so bad, what looked like a foggy day was actually uh, air pollutants, smog. The structure of the atmosphere, as we mentioned earlier, talking about the stratospheric ozone, the lowest, lowermost layer, the troposphere, is where our weather and our air quality concerns reside. And it's those pollutants into that air, uh, that layer of the atmosphere, and how it's transported or not, gives rise to the problems of air pollution. So what is air pollution? It describes the presence of dangerous contaminants in the air we breathe that can cause health or other environmental problems. The health effects of air pollutants are fairly common, that whether it be from historically uh, industrial sources or automotive sources, the human response and the human health effects, breathing, difficulty breathing or discomfort during breathing, is typically one of the things that comes to mind first. But air pollution also has significant and increasingly impact, uh, is impacting terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, whether it be from acid deposition causing death of forests or depositing mercury from coal-fired plants around the globe. There is a worldwide concern mounting over the contribution of air pollutants to environmental damage outside the human factors. So what are these contaminants? Okay. The, as the name implies, something that's contaminated, uh, the, sub, the material that creates that situation is any substance that makes another substance dirty, polluted, or poisonous. In atmospheric systems, they can be either chemicals, fine droplets or aerosols, uh, or tiny particles. So there are a wide variety of different constituents and even gases in some cases. So what are some of the sources of air pollution? You can have natural sources. Uh, the reason the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in the southeastern United States is, has that name is because the smoky appearance is the release of natural uh, organic chemicals from the forests in that region. They do not necessarily create environmental or health risks, but they do contribute to a visual haze. Human activities are the ones we're most familiar with and probably of greatest concern. And of the human activities, the combustion of fossil fuels is the primary source of outdoor air pollutants um, across most categories. In the United States, there are a number of, industri or a number of sources of the major classes of pollutants whether it be transportation, uh, burning fossil fuels at stationary sources such as power plants, factories and industrial output, or another, uh, other sources including releases from solid waste disposal and, and processing. The particulates, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, and carbon monoxide are five of some of the major air pollutants that we're concerned with and managing, and we'll be talking more about those in this lecture. But you can see that depending on the source and the type, carbon monoxide uh, is vastly, so, uh, the main source of that is from transportation. Other sources such as particulates are going to be typically through combustion, uh, burning of fields or agricultural materials or trash or things like that. 
in California, uh, the air pollution sources that we encounter on a daily basis, again, are primarily through uh, transportation, whether it be ground-based uh, gasoline pilot cars and trucks, uh, aircraft, uh, diesel trucks and things, and other sources. Um, these dominate it, as you can recall from our energy lecture, that transportation is the dominant uh, use of energy in California. And all of that combustion contributes to the bulk of the environmental problems we have. It also accounts for why California has the leading uh, restrictive automotion emission stand, uh, equipment requirements for purchases of new vehicles over the last several decades. We simply have so many cars and trucks and vehicles and transportation in California that it has become the main focus of control of air pollution. Air pollution. One of the terms that's probably familiar to most Californians is the notion of smog and from our perspective is really a photochemical uh, type of air pollution. It has a rather interesting um, progression through the day and this you can picture this in Southern California or the east side of the Bay Area where you have early morning traffic in large, uh, larger quantities in, through the day and the combustion of the gasoline uh, leads to uh, elevated exhaust uh, emissions of nitrous oxide. Nitri uh, the, nitrous, the nitrous oxide forms as a result of the combustion uh, with atmospheric nitrogen and oxygen in the car's engine. The nitrous oxides then combine with uh, other free oxygen molecules to create um, another nitrogen, uh, nitrous oxide, and this gives rise to that reddish-brown haze that you'll see uh, in areas with large traffic concentrations. Through the day, UV light um, from sunlight is entering into the system, recall, and through later in the morning, as the sun rises and the day becomes warmer, you'll get uh, increased UV radiation hitting the nitrous oxides, regenerating um, nitrogen oxide and create additional sources for uh, the production of the smog. So light and UV radiation are what drive this. Likewise, you have the oxygen, that's, uh, the individual oxygen atom then can combine with the uh, atmospheric oxygen to create ozone. And recall during the second lecture when we talked about ozone being something we're very uh, appreciative of when its ability to protect us from UV radiation up in the stratosphere. When ozone is down in the troposphere and at ground level, then it's a major irritant to the lungs, the eyes, any mucous membrane because it's a major oxidant. So the ozone then combines with other hydrocarbons coming out of the exhaust and the incomplete combustion of gasoline and diesel and creates uh, peroxide peroxicyl nitrates, or PANs, that are uh, part of the chemical soup that get, what we refer to as photochemical smog, which what I want you to know out of this is that there is the, the combustion of ga uh, fuels combined with atmospheric gases creates a series of chemical reactions that over the day will generate the smog we see and smog we're affected by. Overnight, the sources diminish with diminished traffic, uh, temperatures cool, UV radiation source is gone, and typically some air movement will flush the system out and it'll restart the following day if those conditions persist. Smog, as you might have experienced, is uh, most common in certain types of particular areas. In valleys, um, and in some cases on coastal systems, where you can have a trapping of air um, at the ground surface. Typically, as the ground surface um, warms up, the uh, ground surface air warms and then rises, and then will, uh, the heat will uh, bleed off as the uh, cooler air aloft is, is, and absorbs it. What happens in a smog situation, though, is that there's warmer air aloft and cooler air 
and this is relatively cool air remains trapped underneath and it isn't able to rise and this is what's creating what's called an inversion layer and you can have these typically uh, you will have these typically in warm or hot climates such as you find in uh, California and you might wonder without the valley how this happens in coastal areas but if you get cool air coming in off the ocean with a warmer air aloft with blocking mountains around it and some of the uh, inland basins in, or coastal areas in Southern California especially this cooler air becomes trapped and then the uh, conditions are ripe for cre creation of stagnant air and the collection of photochemical constituents to create smog. So these are characteristic and uh, indicative of certain types of combination of climate and topography and large urban populations with massive reliance on vehicle transportation such as we have in California. So where is air pollution found? It's virtually everywhere on the planet. Uh, it's outdoors, it's indoors. Indoor air pollution we're not going to spend much time on in this class but is something you should be uh, aware of. Uh, I would definitely uh, urge you to read the chapter. Um, there are constituents like radon, uh, chemical vapors coming off of new carpets historically, uh, other sources that can create indoor air pollution. But suffice to say that outdoors um, there are a variety of sources that and with uh, recirculation due to wind um, even the most pristine areas on the planet uh, have some trace evidence of air pollution. Its significance, its impact, will def definitely be closer to the source areas. And you should be aware that you'll find air pollution in both developed and developing countries. This is a scene from Los Angeles, uh, I believe in the early 30s or so, where um, at the advent of the automobile age, under those, again, smog favor and conditions, uh, the air quality in Southern California historically was extremely bad. Modern day Beijing, uh, likewise, looks very much the same in terms of, uh, again, increased reliance uh, and access to uh, private owned automobiles, uh, huge populations, and limited ability to regulate the uh, air pollution at this point has created conditions that are very reminiscent of um, what was uh, the early days of Southern California. So how do we address this? In 1971, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, which had been established the year earlier, began to regulate air quality um, and to protect the public and the environment uh, with regard to six criteria or, and these are priority pollutants. And they did this um, because in, by 1971 we were aware of air pollution problems as a class of problems, but our detailed understanding of air pollution, air, air chemistry, um, transport of contaminants, things like that was still relatively uh, young and there was really only a um, correlation understanding that people that lived in presence of air quality had more health effects and the cause and effect understanding of the effect of air quality on human lungs, eyes, and other aspects of health was not uh, was nowhere near understood at that time. So this concludes the first part of our lecture on air pollution. You should continue on now with part two. In the second part of the lecture, we'll look in more detail at some of the impacts of air pollution. The main focus of our consideration is the human health effects, and you'll notice that we'll see those not only in urban areas, but this public health advisory was a scene from the National Park Service uh, letting people know that Acadia National Park, which is up in Maine, that there was uh, air quality problems that would be affecting uh, the activity levels of people. So even in a non-urban, very remote area, uh, these impacts and warnings are very significant. In urban areas, in California especially, you'll see spare the air days um, and campaigns trying to educate the public on the value of public transportation and reducing 
their activities that would lead to further emissions into the air. So last time, at the end of the last lecture, we mentioned that the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, started to regulate uh, pollutants and identified six priority pollutants. One is particulate matter, and these can be either particles or droplets, but they're large enough and they're not in gas phase that they can have a uh, solid matter type effect. And then there are five chemicals, and these largely are gases. Sulfur oxides, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, ground level ozone, and lead. So these are ones that are primarily concerned for um, air quality in the um, atmosphere. To address the problem of air pollution, the EPA put out advisories in 1971 before the exact medical and uh, biochemical effects of these pollutants were well understood. And this is an example of using a precautionary principle based on the correlation studies of the influence or the presence of health problems at the, in the locations with large uh, or extensive problems of air pollution. Subsequent research has shown that all of those pollutants have, uh, have direct human health effects that can be demonstrated on a cellular level and the physical and chemical understanding of their impacts is now much better understood. This research has expanded to include another 187 air pollutants and most recently carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide was not regulated so much from a human health risk as it was from a climate change uh, risk to human populations and the total environment. So the agency's response has been to starting to regulate and try to control the emissions and try to prevent further problems associated with a much longer list of air pollutants than there were 40 years ago. So as you might have experienced or be aware, there are a variety of impacts and health effects associated with air pollutants. The bottom line is, is that there is no beneficial level of air quality or air pollutants on human health. So any, any air pollution you're exposed to is going to have some health harm. The question is, how significant is it? The exposure level is important from the standpoint from the fact that your body can tolerate and repair damage when it's exposed to some of the regulated contaminants. Our bodies have uh, remarkable self-healing capabilities and can repair uh, a fair bit of damage, but ultimately there are some exposures that simply uh, will cause adverse effects. An example I'll share with you um, up in Oregon back from the 50s and the 60s um, had uh, large grass fields for various types of uh, agricultural crops that were burned. Uh, field burning, as it was referred to in the fall before the winter uh, dormant season, was very common. And so you'd have literally thousands of acres at a time being burned and the smoke and other particulate matter into the atmosphere at times made the Willamette Valley look like a foggy day or the, uh, one of the worst smoggy days in Los Angeles. In the spirit of the London Olympics, uh, I'd point out that at the time, by the early 1970s, when this problem was becoming increasingly linked to human health effects, the premier distance runner in America at the time, Steve Prefontaine, completed a race in Eugene, Oregon, in the middle of this uh, field burning area and literally collapsed just past the finish line, I believe he won, uh, collapsed and was coughing up blood due to the uh, obviously extreme exertion of running and exposure to very, very polluted air. And this has been the subject of concern in the Los Angeles Olympics uh, in 1980, I believe. Um, uh, residents and businesses uh, curtailed their activities and uh, did everything they could to reduce traffic and the air quality during that Olympics was far better than it had been before uh, or after. I was in Los Angeles at the time, or I was in Southern California at the time, and the air quality was very good, and the day it ended, 
the next day the smog came back uh, with full force. So air quality obviously um, can have direct, immediate and direct health effects. Some of these effects uh, magnify when you look at large populations. Uh, it's estimated that about 3 million people will die prematurely uh, due to exposure to air pollution, uh, whether it be both developed or developing countries. And this doesn't include um, the even larger numbers that have, uh, that suffer due with respiratory disease or injury or other health effects um, living with air pollution, both indoor and out. Globally, the uh, largest areas with um, deaths per population are oftentimes linked to uh, areas with uh, air pollution, uh, the largest areas. Um, United States is higher than Canada because we're more industrialized and have a greater population. Uh, China has the worst right now because of its large effort to industrialize and increase its economic output. Um, the, some of the worst air quality on the planet is in, the, uh, in, in China, especially around major urban areas. So again, this is, uh, but you still have significant number of deaths associated with air pollution um, in developed countries as well. The list of actual diseases that are caused by or associated with air pollution is long. Uh, one of the most common is asthma, but other respiratory diseases are, uh, are there. The cataracts um, indicate the, uh, the effect of air pollutants on the eyes. And it's notable that um, it's been documented that uh, babies of women who are using cooking fires, uh, kerosene lamps, other indoor, indoor forms of uh, fuel combustion, uh, their babies have, tend to have lower birth weight and are possibly more susceptible to uh, natal diseases. When you look at particulate air pollution in, in, in specific terms, this chart shows a comparison of cities uh, relative to a town in Wisconsin, Portage, um, at two different periods. A period with less air quality regulation uh, from 74 to 89, and then from 1990 to 1998. So for example, the town of uh, St. Louis marked with an L, the relative mortality decreased from the uh, 1.15 approximately to less than one during that uh, changeover of increased uh, regulation to reduce particulate uh, emissions. So in most of these towns, there's a pretty strong relationship between mortality and uh, particulate exposure based on its ability to impair respiratory health. Indoor air pollution has a long history, given that as long as we've had indoor, uh, or we've been living in houses and dwellings and structures um, for centuries, probably millennia, uh, the earliest sources of, of heat for cooking and for lighting were combustion and burning uh, various types of fuels, coal and other materials, especially wood. And that produces a considerable amount of uh, particulate and soot, and a lot of that, even with the best ventilation available at the time, has had, had chronic impacts on populations over that history. Currently, approximately half of the world's households will cook indoors using some sort of solid fuel, in some cases liquid, but ultimately it's the solid fuels that put out the greatest amount of particulates. Uh, one nonprofit that's been working to change this by uh, increasing the use of solar cookers outside, uh, bringing in solar panels and other attempts to create uh, less wood combustion in the home uh, has reported see that um, with the light increase in lighting, people will see that the walls in their houses are actually black or nearly black from generations of soot deposition during meals. So this is a serious current problem that affects the health and well-being of fully half the population of the Earth. Indoor air pollution, again, is a problem both in developing countries from mainly the source of cooking, but also with developed countries as well. In developed countries, such as the United States, uh, we face an indoor air pollution 
that has to do with the construction, with the cleaners, uh, with the chemicals we use, and the other consumer products that we uh, use on a daily basis. This diagram shows a variety of the different sources uh, dealing from uh, particulates in cooking, uh, chemicals released from building materials uh, such as carpet, uh, paint, and such. You'll see in, in paints nowadays, low VOC formulation language. Uh, VOC star stands for volatile organic chemical, and I would urge you whenever possible to choose low VOC exposure because uh, as a class, volatile organic chemicals uh, do pose an additional cancer risk that's fairly well documented. And has been uh, certain products in that class have been taken off the market uh, because they increase the risk of cancer. Uh, they do not, uh, they are not direct cancer causing in the concentrations you'll encounter, but it's more about managing your risk. So you should study this for your purposes from the standpoint of understanding many of the different hazards that you face with indoor air pollution in the United States. The cost of the of air pollution is, is significant. Uh, the average medical cost um, to treat asthma in the United States is estimated to just under $5,000 almost a decade ago, and you can imagine uh, with sometimes 10% per year increase in health costs, that number has increased substantially today. So many of the healthcare costs that we complain about and struggle to deal with are largely preventable um, but require changes in our uh, other aspects of our consumer society and our use of energy and transportation and such. So to conclude this section, I'll leave you with a study and review question. There's a radioactive gas that occurs naturally from decaying rock, and you can find it uh, seeping in through cracks and foundations, and it has been shown actively to cause lung cancer and it's now commonly tested for during real estate transactions in many places. Which of the following gases is it? I would suggest you look this up and review this for the quizzes and the exam. This concludes the second part of the lecture. Now move on to part three. In our final section of the lecture, we'll look at how air pollution can impact the broader environment. We'll look at aquatic systems and terrestrial. Outdoor air pollution has been recognized for a long period of time. As early as the late 13th century, um, it was noted that the air pollution in London, with combustion especially of coal for cooking fires and heating, was becoming so bad that it was that the coal burning was actually discouraged due to the sulfurous smell. Uh, wood stoves and obviously wood heating were the primary alternative at the time. Given the fact that this coal burning was going on, uh, we can also, I think, reasonably conclude that there would also have been sources of air pollution that would have contributed to acid rain, although the, lar the extent and the magnitude of the acid rain was probably limited given the small, much smaller population at that time. Acid rain, um, which is also uh, referred to as acid deposition, occurs when you, can, when you burn fossil fuels, especially coal. The coal, as an organic com substance, has uh, significant quantities of oxid, excuse me, sulfur and nitrogen compounds in it, which are released during combustion as uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides. When these sulfur and nitrogen compounds get into the atmosphere and encounter rain, they actually go into solution and become sulfuric acid and nitric acid. And then during the rain and uh, rainfall process, they can disassociate uh, the hydrogen ions and release um, acid uh, constituents into both the snow and the rain and then you'll have uh, wet deposition of hydrogen ion, which uh, will lower the pH, uh, and then nitrates uh, or nitrous oxide, nitrates and sulfates um, as well. And these can be uh, important from the standpoint of affecting standing vegetation and adding uh, acid, essentially acid liquid, directly to aquatic systems. 
the impacts are multiple that they can affect both uh, the soil uh, as these acid compounds get into the soil they affect the chemistry of the soil they affect tree roots they affect in the aquatic system the living organisms um, all the way down to the from the the largest visible ones like fish down to plankton and algae and then of course standing vegetation can be damaged both in exposing an acid mist vapor or droplet onto leaves or conifer needles so as the sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides react um, again you end up with droplets and vapor of both sulfuric acid and nitric acid if you recall from basic chemistry the pH scale that ranges from 0 to 14 the acidic end is the low or the low numbers and the basic numbers uh, are above 7 neutral at 7 is where most uh, lakes and waters um, are in the in uh, natural systems and you'll find that the, but yet in this case, the average uh, precipitation in Vermont was as low as 4.3. But there are impacts um, that where certain um, waters develop pHs lower um, than 7, uh, that a variety of fish and then um, others will tend to die. And so, depending on dilution and how the uh, rainfall is uh, affected, uh, you can have and have had significant loss of fish and aquatic life. Note that the most acidic rainfall detected in Vermont was as low as 2.4 and this is extremely uh, acid and um, caustic to uh, living tissues. In terrestrial systems the acids once they reach the soil can release through chemical reactions aluminum and the aluminum, um, if it's taken up by plants, can damage the plants and reduce plants' abilities to grow, and in some cases can cause uh, plant death. It also uh, can cause uh, the acid constituents in the soil solution can uh, mobilize nutrients and wash them out of soils to the point where uh, plants, or excuse me, plants become nutrient deficient because they're no longer present in the soil system. And likewise, you can have direct uh, tree mortality um, with the damage of leaves and needles, um, and in some cases, up to 50% of the red spruce, which are particularly susceptible in the northeastern states, have died due to exposure to acid deposition. On the aquatic system side, if you add acid waters directly or through the, the watershed surrounding it uh, the food layers or excuse me layers of the food web are effective starting with the plankton which are the smallest and have the greatest contact surface area for their total cell size and as they die the things that eat them um, are diminished and so on up to the point where uh, there's a loss of food all the way through the aquatic system Again, uh, it's in, even in um, normal systems, um, unaffected systems by acid rain, the pH is typically higher than 6. And most fish are adapted to the point where it doesn't take much of a lowering of the pH um, to where many fish start to, st to be stressed and eventually to die. And that um, many lakes have become sterile because their pH has fallen below about 4.5. The specific effect of the acidity and the low pH, um, as you might guess, um, interferes with calcium uptake and shell formation and skeletal development in terms of um, the organisms are physically damaged uh, both in development stages and also in their adult phases. And it's these early reproductive stages, however, that are probably the most sensitive to low pH. Uh, any, any young organism or developing organism is going to be probably the most sensitive to environmental stresses, whether it be temperature or in this case uh, chemical conditions in the presence of low uh, or high acid, low pH environments. So when we think about air pollution, I mean the air pollution we saw uh, that, that has been probably received the most attention for acid deposition has been in the Northeast. However, its sources have been through coal-fired power plants in the Midwest and Ohio Valley. 
And the same air masses that take the air pollutants from the, the Midwest into New England have also caused, uh, through transport in the atmosphere, to release acid waters into the North Atlantic, both from direct deposition of rain and also from runoff from the land surface. And this higher toxicity is starting to affect um, salmon populations as far as their um, ability to survive. So they're facing fishing pressures for increased seafood demand, but also uh, diminishing as populations due to environmental uh, air pollution. And the air pollution you see is pretty much a, a global problem. If you think about um, the circulation of storms and the movement of air masses that bring uh, storms from the Pacific into California, uh, pollution does uh, move, can and does move up from the troposphere, our ground level atmospheric layer into the stratosphere. And from there, the jet stream can move it uh, very rapidly around the globe and then it can mix and then return back into the atmosphere. And this can, is a way to contributes to a mixing of greenhouse gases throughout the planet. And the other problem is, is that the, uh, this, the atmospheric convection and circulation vertical movements as well as horizontal means that pollution generated in one place will have effects elsewhere. As we noted, uh, within the continental United States, Midwestern power plants are creating air pollution that's affecting New England and the Atlantic seaboard. On a global scale, there was great concern over radioactive fallout from the Japanese uh, reactor accident coming across the Pacific and actually was detected at trace concentrations in the western United States. So this is a global problem and not one that necessarily we can um, ignore by virtue of the fact that if we clean our own air up that it's the only ones we have to be concerned with. So the control of air pollution is, is, has a dominant role with the government. The United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency has played a major role in, in creating regulations that have reduced the amount of air emissions and um, required uh, cleanup of uh, or cleaner technologies. Uh, just coal scrubbers, uh, coal fired plants have scrubbers, uh, pollution control equipment on cars, such that we've definitely seen an improvement in the United States air quality since the 1960s. And this can be attributed to government regulation and policies with direct benefits to the population in terms of health and reduced health costs. And one of the main reasons that you need government intervention is that, again, as we noted with um, air circulation not respecting political boundaries, uh, air quality problems are national and international in scope and they require both uh, federal level um, intervention and regulation and also global cooperation uh, treaties and agreements, much the same as we saw with the uh, Kyoto Protocol to uh, deal with the global uh, loss of ozone. As noted, the air quality has improved. Um, these charts show from the California examples that uh, for most places in the United States, we're making uh, progress with some of the pollutants, uh, carbon monoxide, and especially lead has not been eliminated, but has been significantly reduced. reduced. One of the areas that, uh, one of the reasons why uh, we've made progress, say, with things like uh, uh, automobile exhaust um, reductions is the fuel additives, uh, oxygenates, um, that have been added to gas to make it burn cleaner in cars, as well as changes in the uh, pollution control technology of cars. However, one fuel additive, MTBE, which you may have heard reference to, is, it's been in the news. Um, unfortunately, while it had, makes the gas uh, burn cleaner, it's also uh, was fairly no, belatedly determined to be damaging to uh, fuel lines and gas station dispensers and pumps, such that gasoline leak stations leaked a significant amount of MTBE into local groundwater systems, requiring rather expensive and ongoing cleanup efforts. So it's a good news, bad news situation, and that. Uh, that we haven't yet learned to effectively anticipate the side effects 
of even pollution control measures such as the fuel additives. Other areas, um, especially particulates, are a problem from the standpoint of becoming more uh, pronounced in some areas and some of those like the Owens Valley aren't really tied to um, vehicles or other sources they're more a problem with the um, fact that the water supplies in Owens Valley were diverted to Los Angeles leaving the Owens Lake bed completely bare and the alkali dust that comes off of that is a rather significant air quality problem at least in the local area but in general, there are a variety of systems where the air quality situation has improved and others still where there's much work left to, to do. So methods for combating or preventing or uh, reducing the effect of air pollution on you, um, this is part of your own self-education that should extend beyond the course, both in terms of public conversations about outdoor air pollution and also um, what you'll do with indoor sources. You can readily find um, sources of information on the web to determine what sort of air quality conditions you have locally and some of those will be posted through the class. But you need to be able to self-teach uh, wherever you end up to find out what your um, local air is like and what sort of chemicals or uh, air pollutants are you being exposed, exposed to. And this includes, again, from both from outdoor air pollution and from indoors as well. Another thing that you'll be able to do over time, hopefully more, even more than today, is to um, exercise choice uh, through your utility if possible to reject uh, coal-powered um, electricity and instead re request renewables. But Avoiding coal is very important from the standpoint of it being one of the major sources of air pollution we have in the world today. So in the personal choice uh, arena, again, um, it's not a bad idea to have your house checked for radon at some point if it hasn't been done, both where you live now and or um, in sitting in your parents' home. Uh, it's very, usually through uh, public health or somebody you can get a, a radon meter, let it run overnight, and then get some sort of a, an assessment of whether or not you're being exposed to that. And there are different hazard maps because a lot of the radon hazard has to do with what the geology um, of the location you're living in. Some places uh, just don't have much of a radon hazard. Other areas are fairly high depending on its, the amount of radon in the rocks. As far as household cleaners go, um, you should become um, more conscious of those and look for sources on, uh, of those that are more natural products and ones that are um, at least somewhat documented as having minimal risk of health. Um, there are a number of natural cleaning agents and there are increasingly consumer options to where you're not being exposed to um, a large chemical load. My rule of thumb uh, is if I can't pronounce it, and I can't understand, and I find it difficult to find out what it is and what its effects are. I try not to use it. Uh, when you have um, pets in the area, um, although these aren't necessarily toxics, they do present um, various sorts of particulate, uh, dust mites, and uh, other forms of dander, which could end up with a, an allergic response down the road. And uh, it's also important to generally avoid cigarette smoke. Um, especially in closed areas because the 45 or 50 chemicals in cigarette smoke nowadays it includes radon and at least a couple of other trace uh, radioactive components which are naturally occurring uh, picked up by the tobacco plant from soils.